Mathematics in the Modern World We shall talk about patterns in social interaction. You know what? There's a lot of patterns to be discovered in social interaction. Which is why I'm kind of uh, curious why very little is, is devoted to patterns in social interaction in the curriculum guidelines of, of CHED for math in the modern world. But in my book, I gave a modest quantity of attention to these things, the patterns that arise from social interaction. Before we go there, let us go back to the meaning of proportionality. Proportionality was introduced to you way back in grade 7. Direct proportionality and inverse proportionality. So P is directly proportional to Y if and only if. Okay, so this is how we write it. This is read as P is directly proportional to Y. That is a symbol for proportionality. It does not mean infinity. So P is directly proportional to Y if and only if P is equal to K times Y for some positive real number K. I am restricting the value of K here to positive real numbers. Inverse proportionality, P is inversely proportional to Y. If and only if, okay, so this is how you write it. You read this as P is inversely proportional to Y. If that is the case, then P is equal to K over Y for some scalar number K. I think right now you already have some understanding of what this means, direct proportionality and inverse proportionality. It's like when Y increases, P also increases. But for inverse proportionality, okay, Y is in the denominator. When Y increases, and that one is constant, when Y increases, that whole thing, the quotient, decreases. So that is the idea behind inverse proportionality. When 1 is gaining in, in size or gaining in measure, the other is, is decreasing in size or in measure. So let us pay attention to the graphs. This is the graph when P is equal to K times Y. This one is the graph for P is equal to K over Y. But for social phenomenon that can be modeled after inverse proportionality, we don't have to pay attention to this part of the graph. Because I cannot yet see a social event there or a social phenomenon there that requires us to pay attention to when Y is negative or when P is negative. For much of the social phenomenon or events out there that can be modeled by inverse proportionality, this, this, this is the graph that matters. So I will show you some examples of events that show inverse proportionality and direct proportionality. How about the growth rate of, of economies? You know what? The economy of a nation is measured by the GDP and it has a growth rate. Well, it just seems that the relation or the association between fertility rate and growth rate is one of inverse proportionality. This is our observation. In general, nations with high GDP growth rates show declining fertility rates. In general, also, wealthier nations have populations that are declining in size. Okay, so let us pay attention to this graph and to this notation. So this one is inverse proportionality. When incomes of nations as measured by the size of the GDP or measured by the growth rate of the GDP increases, the fertility rates of women or the population size of the nation or of the community decreases. So that is the idea behind inverse proportionality. When this one increases, this one decreases. And that is also revealed by the graph. So this one is a decreasing curve. As Y increases, the value of P decreases. This is a scatter plot of the nations and their corresponding GDP per capita as measured in $1,000 and the fertility rate. 
So Iraq, for example, by the way, this is a data taken from 2015. So Iraq, for example, its GDP per capita is something like uh, 16,000 US dollars. 16,000 US dollars. But the fertility rate per women in a country like Iraq is, is somewhere between 4 and 5. It's close to 4, something like 4.1. So again, uh, what is our understanding of fertility rate? We can look at it as, as the number of children born per woman in a country like Iraq. An adult woman would give birth to four kids in her lifetime. For the U.S., the U.S., the GDP per capita is, is between 50 and 60,000. But their fertility rate is a little less than two. How about the Philippines? The Philippines per capita income, GDP per capita is 3.5 thousand US dollars. And the fertility rate of our women is, is close to three. So that means on average, Filipino adult woman will give to three babies in her lifetime. How about Japan? Japan is a wealthier nation. Its GDP per capita is something like 35,000 US dollars and its fertility rate is only 1.39. So it's between 1 and 2. Again, what is the pattern that is revealed by this scatter plot? Fertility rate is, is inversely proportional to GDP per capita as the fertility rate, at least this is what we are seeing here, as the fertility rate of a nation decreases, the per capita income increases. And the other way around, as the per capita income of a nation uh, decreases, the fertility rate of their woman increases. How about in Southeast Asia? So this is the graph, a line graph showing the fertility rates of the nations in ASEAN. So for the Philippines, the pink one, the bright pink one, that one, that line. In year 2000, the fertility rate of our women is, is, is close to 4. It's a, it's a little less than 4 or 3.8, 3.9. By 2019, it's less than 3. That is a big change. That is a big change. You know what? I can remember the days... When I was in school, and our teachers are saying the per capita or the fertility rate of women in our country is something like 6. So that must be in the years 1970. So this is the trend in the fertility rate in our country as, as a function of time. It is declining. How about the GDP? Well, the GDP of various nations is increasing. Let us put these two graphs together. As income rises, the fertility rate decreases. Another social phenomenon that shows a pattern, the business cycle. The business cycle goes this way. It shows a pattern of ups and downs. That pattern of ups and downs is measured by the growth rate of the GDP. So I showed to you the line graph showing the GDP growth rate of various nations in ASEAN. But that is like the, the bird's eye view. That is like the trend. But if we shall look closely to the movement in the growth rate as a function of time, it is not a smooth, steady increase in the values of the GDP growth rate. Something like this happened. There is a cycle of ups and downs, and in business, you call it expansion. It will reach its peak, so the GDP will expand. After reaching a peak, it will recede. And then the depression is when there is actually a, a contraction. A contraction is a shrinking in the size of the economy. You call that uh, the depression. And by the way, right now, I am doing this video during the times of the pandemic. We are beginning to see a contraction in the economy. And then after, after the passing of some time, the economy will recover. It will expand again. It will peak and it will undergo recession again. The trend in our GDP growth rate, this is before the pandemic, okay? The trend is increasing. 
But if you were to look closely, closer to the true story is it is not a steady gradual increase in the size of the GDP. It is actually a cycle of ups and downs. And you can see it clearly from the data that I gathered from, from the World Bank. This is how our GDP behaved from year 2000. No, actually, this is not year 2000. This is year 1998 to year 2020 today. So this is almost like real-time data. Look at that. This one happened during the pandemic. If we shall ignore this, this 2020 thing, from 1998, to 2019, the trend is increasing. But if we shall pay attention to the actual movement of the GDP, it's not a gradual ascent in, in value. Its movement is, is cyclic. It is a series of ups and downs, although overall the trend is increasing. There are more patterns in social interaction. I will not talk a lot about them, I want to give you the chance to speak about this yourself, either through an essay or th through a video essay. If you were to write this as an essay, written essay, one page max. If you were to prepare a video essay for this, two minutes, video essay max. These are some of the patterns that I see, and we shall state the direction of proportionality. Education and income. In general, the more educated people are or a person is, the higher the income he or she gets. And so that is one of direct proportionality. In our country, there is a direct proportional relation between literacy and English and income. And I can tell you from experience, many people are not formally employed. You know what? Because they cannot even bring themselves to apply to a company. Why? Because they have to fill in an application form. And the application form is written in English. They are discouraged. They do not have the courage to go on because they know they cannot accomplish the first task that has to be done when you are applying for a job, which is to fill in an application form. And they can't even do it. It's the same with opening a bank account. Many people in our country cannot or would not open a savings account because they are discouraged by the task needed to fill in an application form to open a bank account. It's the same for claiming for SSS benefits, GSIS benefits, Phil Health benefits. One of these days, time will come, you will be there. And you would know what I'm talking about. You would need to be literate in English in order to take advantage of those benefits. And so the relation between income and literacy as I see it, English literacy is one of direct proportionality. Education and size of family. The more educated the person is, the smaller is the size of his family. If you want to see the size of the family of someone who is not so educated, well, look at your neighbors. Maybe beside your house is a squalid house where people never even finished grade school. And look at how many people are living in that squalid house. So this one is a case for inverse proportionality. Now, this is just my hunch. And this one is based on my readings in the literature about IQ. IQ and being incarcerated in jail. If you were to run a survey, a psychological test in a jail where you will test for people's IQ there in the jail, I have the feeling that there is an inverse proportionality between IQ and the fact that you are inside the jail. I think that in general, criminals who gather there, who are put there inside a jail have lower IQs. I will stop talking about this because these are interesting issues and I want to give you the chance to talk about this yourself. And you can talk about this in the form of an essay, one page maximum, or you can produce a video essay, two minutes maximum.